Well, the world continues to watch the military invasion of Ukraine, wondering if some sort of peace pact can be arranged or if this will end up expanding to a much broader war involving NATO. Joining us to discuss this is Dr. Christian Luprecht. He is a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada and Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Welcome to Bridge City News, Professor Luprecht. It's so great to have you on a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. Okay, absolutely. Now, many of us are wondering what is stopping Russia from having more military success? Is Russia holding back on purpose for some strategic reason, or is there really some miscommunication going on, some poor supply lines or that kind of thing? Yeah, there's both of that is, uh, is the case here. So one is that I think the Russian leadership in particular, but perhaps also the Russian military just overestimated their capacities. Attackers often do this, and they underestimated both the capacities and the determination of the uh, of the defenders. Um, specifically, I mean, we knew that the Russians have command and control issues, morale issues. Much of their military relies on conscript forces. So these are not usually the most motivated forces to fight. Uh, it has maintenance issues, modernization issues. Uh, and as we see serious communication issues, both among their forces on the ground, as well as between the ground forces and the Air Force. Um, and then they have significant logistics challenges. Uh, so being able to feed your troops and keeping your vehicles fueled. Um, and so in light of that, they've resorted to, as we know, unfortunately, shelling, because that's about the only thing that they seem to be able to do under the uh, circumstances. But it also appears that that whole operation was just very poorly planned and even more poorly executed. And so I think it shows that we, we just can't take, I think one of the mistakes we made in the run up to this is we pointed to these hundreds of thousands of Russian troops and we kind of bought into that. This is this amazing fighting machine. And people like me always point out, this is not the Soviet army. So, you know, let's just see how how they actually perform, and I think they performed even worse than people like myself had anticipated. <laughs> well, I'm just curious now with all these challenges that you're mentioning, uh, how far do you think they'll be able to advance? Do you think that they'll actually be able to, you know, maintain what Putin's desire was? Well, so that would, requires us to actually first determine what was Putin trying to achieve. And I think he had four objectives, political objectives. So remember that the military operation is a means to, to an end. So the first is regime change in Kiev, and clearly the Ukrainians have denied him that. And if they can continue to hold Kiev, I think that will be a significant turning point in the war. But it would also, I think, then pose an existential risk to the continuity of the Putin regime. The second was to reduce Ukraine basically to the status of a demilitarized republic, so of the status that, he, that it had under the Soviet Union as one of the 27 republics. He's failed on that as well. He was trying to divide NATO and the European Union. Well, they've come together like no one had anticipated. So he's failed at that. And he was trying to reduce the U.S. influence in Europe and push the, Europe, uh, the Americans um, out of Europe and undo the post-Cold War security architecture. And he has failed at that utterly and completely as well. So now the question needs to be on the military operation, what are you actually trying to achieve? If you can't actually get any of the political aims that you had um, without now calling the Putin regime, um, delegitimizing Putin, delegitimizing his own regime by virtue of the underperformance of his military. And so the concern here is that the Russians will double down on significant violence towards civilians in order to achieve their objective, in particular in taking Kiev. And this is part and parcel of Russian military doctrine, gross human rights violations. If you look at Africa, you look at Aleppo, um, you look at uh, Chechnya. And you had asked earlier about Russian capacities. The one significant capacity outside of tactical or strategic nuclear weapons the Russians have not yet deployed is their strategic bombing force. And that's, I think, what the Ukrainians are concerned about when they ask for a no-fly zone. Mm, it's so scary. And, and, you know, some are speculating, too, that Russia could start to use heavy artillery and just start destroying cities such as they did in Syria. So how likely do you think that this is and how effective would it be? Well, I think this is what we're seeing. So the Russians in the first three or so days of the invasion uh, ran against their own military doctrine and deployed largely like 
the infantry. And that light infantry was completely defeated by the Ukrainians. And so the Russians now literally don't have enough soldiers to take all these cities. So the only option they have is to try to subjugate the cities with artillery and with airstrikes and by trying to encircle them and besiege them. So the Russians now have a real problem because they don't have the instruments to achieve what they actually wanted to on on these cities. And so, uh, as you point out, I think we're going to see even more shelling than we have previously. But when people call for a no-fly zone to kind of to to limit the humanitarian catastrophe that we're seeing, they're forgetting that the bulk of the of the destruction on the ground is being wreaked uh, by. Uh, artillery and by tank shells, not from the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And of course, Putin has put his nuclear forces on high alert. And uh, as we've seen that he's shelled a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. So is is this just intimidation or is it possible that he would actually use nukes? Well, so the power plant, I think, was sort of an incidental target in the sense that Russian forces, it was sort of on the way of where Russian forces were headed. Plus, it gives them a significant control over the power supply of much of the industrial and population heartland of eastern Ukraine. When we talk about the nuclear option, it's not exactly clear what Putin was trying to achieve here, because we haven't actually observed any change in the posture, um, in, in nuclear posture by the Russians. It might have simply been to draw a red line and make sure NATO stays out of Ukraine, including no-no-fly zone. It might have been just a, a, mil a Russian military doctrine. So the U.S., for instance, put its nuclear forces on uh, a high alert after 9-11, just as a matter of, uh, of precaution. Um, it might very well be that he intends to use tactical nuclear weapons on the Ukrainian battlefield if he can achieve his objectives by conventional force. Or it might be that we have a lunatic in the Kremlin who's willing to do whatever it takes uh, to achieve his objectives. And if it becomes an existential threat to him, then he'd rather destroy the world and uh, have everybody go down together than him being decapitated by his own people. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I was just going to ask you about that since you mentioned lunatic. Of course, everyone's speculating about his mental health, so possibly his physical health, right? So is there any truth to this, that Putin's either mentally ill or terminally ill and therefore wants to make a name for himself before he dies, kind of like you said, you can kind of go out in a big legacy, I guess. In his mind, it would be a legacy. <laughs> yeah, it's, so certainly Ukraine is about him establishing a legacy for himself, right? If you watched that curious speech two and a half weeks ago on the Monday night where he basically said that Lenin and Stalin were wrong in granting the status of republic to Ukraine in the first place. He's clearly trying to put himself historically above Lenin or Stalin. He wants to be seen as this great historical leader who somehow restored Russian glory. So there's certainly a bit of the megalomaniac um, within, uh, within him. What his mental health is, so there's broad agreement among analysts that the Putin we have today is not the Putin we had two years ago, that he has changed significantly over the last two years. P the Putin we had previously was always a very calculated, rational choice risk taker, pushing the envelope as far as he could, but not pushing over the edge. And it seems on this operation, he appears not to have listened either to his advisors or the advisors he had are all yes men that are telling him what he wants to hear because they probably believe the same sort of deranged, dysfunctional worldview that he has. Um, but Marco Rubio, so the senior serving senator on the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, um, 10 days ago made an interesting remark that he basically said that after having briefed by, been briefed by the CIA, there's something going on with Putin that we can't tell you. Um, so it appears that there may also be more going on than meets the eye um, when it comes to Putin's ability to make um, to make decisions, let alone make rational or sensible decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be really far off, but is is there any thought to the fact that because the U.S. changed administration, that Putin now feels like he can be more brazen about stuff? Would he do this if Donald Trump were in office? What, what are your thoughts on that? That's a really great question. So certainly after the disastrous drawdown in Afghanistan by U.S. forces, uh, Putin certainly felt that there was uh, a significant 
significant moment of weakness, both by the United States and within the Western alliance. So it certainly emboldened him. And he certainly sensed that Biden was vulnerable domestically. Um, and I think did not anticipate the extent to which uh, the Russian invasion would bring out the Cold War warrior uh, in President Biden, who, of course, spent a couple of decades under the Cold War. So he knows all about political, economic and military containment of Russia. The Trump question is really interesting, too, because there's a sense, of course, that Biden was able to bring the Western alliance together because he has sort of a more multilateral approach. Make no mistake, American foreign policy is always about unilateralism. It's just with Trump, it's unilateralism with a frown. With Biden, it's unilateralism with a smile. It's still U.S. unilateralism, but it's sort of the, the smile of trying to get everybody together and to do things together. It's an interesting question of the extent to which Trump would have been able to be the same sort of unifying force within NATO and with the European Union. But there is a Trump silver lining in all this. So if you look at how much European countries, first and foremost Germany, have now reinvested in defense, I mean, undoing decades of defense policy, increasing defense spending by 50% overnight, or at least promising to do so, the chancellor still has to get this through parliament, let alone his own party. That suggests that there's also, I think, a cognizance by Europeans that the Americans are not the reliable partner they once were. And so that it's important, increasingly important for Europe to look after its own affairs and its own neighborhood. And clearly, if nothing else, the invasion of Ukraine showed just how over-reliant European allies are on American support when push comes to shove. Wow. Wow, interesting. Very much so. Now, with peace talks continuing, some are saying that perhaps a pledge from Ukraine to stay out of NATO and to demilitar demilitarize would possibly bring an end to the fighting. What are your thoughts on that? So this goes back to comments made by George Kennan in the 1990s when Bill Clinton started with NATO enlargement. Uh, George Kinn, of course, the famous U.S. ambassador that basically called out the Cold War um, and developed the whole strategy of containment. And he made the comments at the time that um, NATO enlargement would be a red line for the Russians. Um, and the Russians then felt betrayed by the West in areas such as Kosovo in Libya. Um, in 2007, you get the turn at the Munich Security Conference by Putin uh, uh, pivoting to this much more aggressive uh, posture towards the U.S. In 2008, you get George W. Bush then basically offering Ukraine and Georgia membership in NATO, but without laying out a pathway. And I think that's when it sort of became really a red line for the Russians. So you can argue, and people like Michael O'Hanlon, for instance, in his most recent book, have argued that we could have avoided all this if we had just said to the Americans that Ukraine and Georgia are just never going to join NATO, and that'll be the end of that. At the same time, why should the Western democratic world let itself be extorted by a bully? Why should countries not be able to make their own sovereign decisions, whether they're going to orient themselves eastward towards Moscow or westward towards Europe and Washington? Why should they be constrained in their ability to make those decisions? Is it not part and parcel of the international world order that sovereignty means you make those decisions? And what Putin is showing is that he has complete disregard for country sovereignty, not just Ukraine, but he doesn't even treat European countries as real genuine partners. He feels that the only people that need to be taken seriously in world affairs are other superpowers, first and foremost among them Russia, uh, the, so the United States. So which is why Russia and Putin always said, you know, we're going to negotiate the future of Ukraine, the future of Europe bilaterally with Washington, basically cutting European states out altogether. And so I think it's important to demonstrate that sovereignty actually matters. And territorial integrity has been the fundamental principle of keeping Europe stable, prosperous, harmonious since the end of the Second World War. And Putin has fundamentally violated that principle, and he has done so repeatedly. And I think it's important to send a message that we simply can't condone this sort of behavior because we, certainly I don't, and I think nobody in the West really wants to go back to the sort of uh, might is right world that we had in the first half of the 20th century, because we know what humanitarian, political, social, and 
economic catastrophe that brought upon us. Well, uh, it looks like we are out of time, but thanks so much for your expertise today, Dr. Christian Leprecht. It's uh, great to have you on. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.